Good morning. Um, welcome to Lapeer Community Church. I'm really glad you're here as um, there are get people, you know, getting ready to watch this. I pray, you know, that um, that the reading plan has been a blessing to you, that you've been able to um, learn more about the Bible and stories maybe you've never heard. Enjoy them as much as I do. Um, we are in week 15. We're covering, uh, so if you've got the reading plan at lapeercc.org, you could download that plan. We are in week 15. If you're not caught up, that's okay. You can catch up later or just jump in right where we're at. But we are covering the last chapter of Deuteronomy, chapter 34, 1 through 12, and Joshua um, chapters 1 to 5, verse 12. And that's what we're that's the reading for this week. So it's uh, about really about five chapters, maybe a little more um, than five chapters, not a whole lot. Um, and next week we'll cover, you know, we'll be in week 16, and we're doing that service 10 o'clock at the church in, a, in person. So we'll have a live face-to-face -face service next week at 10 a.m. at the church outdoors. So bring your own lawn chairs. And if the weather's bad, just stay home. We'll do, a, I'll have an uploaded video like this one where you can just watch it at home whenever you have the time and on Sunday morning. You can just go to Facebook or go to the Lapeer, uh, Lapeer Community Church YouTube page and watch the video for the teaching for next week. So um, next week, 10 a.m., we're going to start 10 a.m. services outside every week and um, we'll go from there. Then um, we had a challenge last week to the kids. We had um, you to look in the Bible and find out how many talking animals you can find. So uh, how many guys actually did that? Um, you can, you and your parents hopefully dug those out. Um, initially, I thought there were three, but there are only two. There, I thought there was a bird in the, in the book of Revelation, but there's, there, there isn't, it's an angel. But there are two. Last week's donkey, um, and I hope you liked reading that story about Balaam's donkey that was uh, talking back at him. And then you have the snake in the Garden of Eden, way back in the one of the first weeks we, the first week of the plan, I think we, we talked about the, the talking serpent, the snake. So those are the only two animals that are talking in the Bible. So this week I have a different challenge for you. And if you'll hold on, I will share that with you. But let me pray for you first, and we'll pray and then we'll get started with this week's um, uh, message. Father in heaven, I thank you for the Bible. I thank you that it's not boring, that the stories in it are amazing and um, really confusing sometimes, but amazing. And the acts of God that are written down that for us to read about are amazing and, um, and fun to learn about. And so, Father, we pray, we look forward to the day we see you do those things again and um, that we would love you and serve you and see you do things for mankind, um, that your will would be fulfilled. I pray, Lord, this morning that you would teach us from your word and that you would um, guide us in your word and that um, you would, um, your spirit would cause us to be passionate in our desire to serve you with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, this week, we, like I said, we're finishing up the last chapter of Deuteronomy. Now, the first five books of the Bible are called the Pentateuch. They're the, that's just penta means five. And so the five books of the Bible would be um, the first five that we covered, uh, Genesis, Exodus, uh, Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. And then, um, <clears throat> then what you have is we go into Joshua. And that's what we're going to cover here somewhat today. But I want to mention the last chapter of Deuteronomy because of Moses' disobedience, and if you read your reading, you know what he did, and um, that eliminated his ability to go in the promised land. So God said, I can take you there, you can see it, but you cannot enter. And so because of what he did, he is um, <clears throat> taken to a hill in chapter 34, a mountaintop, and he looks into the land. He gets to see all the promised land that the Jews, after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, finally get to take possession of the land flowing with milk and honey and um and at that point he dies and nobody knows where he's buried god took care of him god buried him but he died at that spot and and then joshua is to take over now the jewish people say they're going to follow joshua but um <clears throat> it is really at this point that god does another miracle as astounding as one of the ones he the most astounding he did for moses he's going to do for the israel for the israelites um, under Jos uh, Joshua's leadership that's going to confirm his leadership and it's very similar to the crossing of the Red Sea. It is the crossing 
of the Jordan River on dry ground. So God then, instead of parting the water, he just holds back the water. And they enter into the promised land by going through water again on dry ground. And so um, if you read through this, you get to chapter 4 of Joshua. So if you turn to Joshua chapter 4, we'll see um, them going actually through this down in verse 5 is where they actually start. And so they get to the, the uh, Jordan River and it's flooded. It's, it's over its, ba its, its bounds and everything else and just overflowing because during the harvest it's always flooded. That's the Jordan River. And so it's harvest time. And they're getting ready to cross the Jordan River. Now, <clears throat> what happens if you go with me till verse 5 in Joshua, we'll, re we'll read and see what happens. So, and Joshua is speaking to them in verse 5, and he said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Now, this is actually, this is interesting. I'm going to back up a little bit. They were, the, the priests were, uh, were carrying the Ark of the Covenant or the Ark of the Lord on their shoulders on poles that carried this golden uh, chest that's called the Ark. And in there is the Ten Commandments, the stone tablets with the Ten Commandments chiseled in there. It is the uh, staff that Aaron had that blood that um, budded to prove that he was supposed to be the high priest. And it has a jar, which would be a clay jar, with manna that they ate when they were in the wilderness every day for 40 years. And so that actually is in the ark. And the priests are supposed to walk into the water. So it's flooded and flowing harsh, but they have to believe that they're doing what God wants before they step in the water, that they're not going to be washed away. And they step into the water, and as soon as they do, it says the water piles up. So that's what we're going to um, read now in verse 5 of Joshua chapter 4. And he said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of Israel to serve as a sign among you. So a uh, one man from each of the tribes was supposed to get a boulder, a large rock, not really a boulder, but a big rock that he's gonna haul off on his shoulder. And it's supposed to take it from the, the riverbed of the Jordan. And so verse six, it says, to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan River was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and when it, um, when, they, when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And these stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So when they went into the river, the water stopped up. And it says it heaped up and it heaped up for 15 miles uh, back up the Jordan River to a, a town called Adam. And um, so it, it just stopped. They cross on dry ground. One man from each tribe is supposed to take a rock on his shoulder and bring it to the other side. And after all Israel crosses, they then put these stones on top of one another. Now there's a, there's a few. They, they could have made it a pile, but generally um, when you see standing stones that are in a pile, they're one stone stacked on another. So they were probably flatter stones. And, um, and there's tons of different uh, memorials like this all over the ancient Near East. Now, they, it's not just Israel that would do these things. They, they, they have found stones that are like big ones that stood up, like sometimes they're like big ones that are laying down and they stand them up like this. And you, we've talked about one of those at Bethel when, um, when uh, Esau, or Jacob, was at, at night, he had a dream and he saw God um, and angels and, 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 a, and a stairway leading to heaven with angels ascending and descending on it. And he marked that place and the, the stone he put his head on, he stood up. It would be one big stone. But there are some stones that are like 30 feet tall that have over time gone deeper into the ground. So they're like 20 feet in the ground and 10 feet is above the ground. These are massive stones that they would erect to mark significant events or they would be holy places. And so, but all over Israel, Israelites did this as well. A lot of them would be big standing stones or their stones piled one on top of another. Now there's not a single discovery of any stones that they can mark to any single event in the Bible. They, there are just so many of them, they don't know what they stand for or if there are events that are marked in the Bible or if there are different ones. We might actually be able to see a set of standing stones that were put up during the Bible times, but we don't know if that's just a different set of stones or not. 
And so, but they, they just did this often to mark a significant event or covenant or commitment that was made between um, God and man. And so that was what was done. Now, God, all the way through the Old Testament and all the way through those first five books we read in the law, he is talking to them about doing things to remember what God did for them, yeah, to re- free them from as slaves, to remind them of their, her, they're his people, to uh, remember laws that he had in place, um, to choose life and not death. He would have all significant events. He would do these with festivals, like the Passover feast is a festival to the Lord to remember when he passed over the Israelites in the 10th plague, but the eldest male of each household in Israel, in Egypt died, but not the Israelites. So that feast is to remember that God passed over them and they didn't suffer from that plague. There are other um, things that they do. They're supposed to wear scripture on their foreheads and put it on their houses to remember the law of God to follow it and teach it to their children. And so they would do these things to remember from one generation to the next. Well, another one of these things is actually to put up a pile of stones or a standing stone to remember. And God says to remember all over the place, all over the place. In the Old Testament and the New Testament, things are supposed to remember. But markers of to remind us is not something we do as much that much um, in New Testament Christianity though maybe we should we do some and we don't recognize them at this way but we do this one of the most common ones is the um, wedding ring when you put this ring on if you're like me you were before a pastor who made you swear before God um, that you would love honor and cherish your wife before God you said I do ring is put on and that ring is a reminder of the commitment you made to your husband or your wife um, before God and it's a reminder to everybody else who sees it that you are no longer available that you've made a covenant with someone else that you're not available so it's a reminder to the people who see it and the people who wear it and um, so th- that's one of those reminders um, <clears throat> another one is is communion communion is something jesus told us to do whenever we gather to remember him so i want you to go ahead and open up your bibles to first corinthians chapter 11 and when you get there we'll, we'll start reading what paul taught about communion he's quoting jesus and he's not quoting what jesus said and he's been taught by the disciples jesus actually taught him personally after his resurrection he told him what he did with the disciples in the last the last supper And so if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, drop all the way down to verse 24 and read with me. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, The cup, this cup is the cup and uh, is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So do this in remembrance of me is something Jesus set a a new um, activity, a new event. It's not a festival. It's, It's something that's supposed to happen way more often. And so we do this. Every time we do this, we do this to remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. His death purchased our salvation, our freedom. It redeemed us so that we could be his children, you know, God's children, and in relationship with Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the Father forever. And um, so that would be um, another one that's very specifically laid out in the New Testament. But I, I think often about what we do personally. What are the markers that God has done something in your life that you would want to mark in some way to never forget and you would want to tell your future progeny, you know, you're, you're the people who know about you in the future. Many of us um, may build a life where we want to be remembered, all right? And um, so um, people will build monuments to themselves. Um, there might be tombstones somewhat to remember you by, but there there are some people build businesses um, they, they, or you make history somehow. I always remember as a, as a young teenager, awed by the life of Beethoven, that he's memorialized in music that he wrote, that thousands, you know, hundreds of years later, people know he, who, who wrote music, even if they don't like classical music. You go, bum, 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 everybody knows that's Beethoven. And they may not know anything else about Beethoven, but they know he wrote that. 
And um, it's astounding to me that you could remember, take such a little thing and remember the life and name of a foreigner that lived hundreds of years earlier. And um, so poems are another way we remember things, uh, events in the past, you know, even though some of them aren't accurate, like, you know, uh, trying to think of the, the, the ride of Paul Revere, you know, remember Paul Revere because of a poem, even though the poem's not that accurate. Um, but I started thinking about what, what, what in your life has God done that's so significant you don't want to forget nor do you want anybody else to forget it either is there something that God has done for you or an event in your life that's so significant that you never want to stop thanking God for it that you never want to forget it and you also want other people to know what he did for you and um, I've thought about this a lot actually and I may have shared this before but I I was reading a book about a guy who wrote a biography, you know, and it's nothing like he didn't do anything spectacular. It was just what life was like in like 1906 in uh, the frontier in Colorado before there were much of a town or anything. His dad moved his family out on a ranch, and he was he was describing what life was like on the on the plains in Colorado and um, being a rancher and. And then his other, the rest of his life, there were other books that he just wrote about what what life was like, and I I love those books, but I'm thinking, man, his great grandchildren get to read about what life was like for their great grandfather. I wished I had something to read from my grandparents to see what was life like, or my great great grandparents. That would be even more amazing to know what was my ancestor, what was their life like, what did they feel. What what did they care about? What was life like? When was it hard? What what events did they never want anybody to forget? And everything is forgotten because they didn't write down anything. And so uh, a few years ago, I began writing my own biography, not for publication or anything, but just for my children and the children that come after that. And I wrote about you know the time I caught my first fish. You know, I I, I had a little ice fishing pole and I cast it out. And I didn't have any bait, so I didn't have any worms or anything. I put a leaf on my hook, which isn't going to catch anything. But because the line got tangled on the pole, I slapped it out there, and the hook just hit the water really hard, and I stabbed a minnow through the back. And I pulled that out, and there was a Boy Scout on the shoreline saying, that's awesome, cast it out there. So I put it back out there, and right away I caught a giant bluegill, and I was super excited, and I was probably like five or six years old. Um, but it's the first fish I remember catching. And so I wrote that in the book. You know, there's funny things. There's really hard things about, you know, when I suffered in grade school from treatment from teachers or other students. There's there's things I really cared about. You know, how I discovered my love for music in the fifth grade. But more important than anything is telling them the story about how God got a hold of my life. You know, and I tell the story in church over and over and over. I'm not going to do that now. But writing it down, all the events that led up to the point of time where I, I said, I'm going to follow you and no one's going to stop me, and my life changed. And for 35 years almost since then, still Jesus Christ has been so important. So I want to write down the things that God did for me in that moment and the things afterwards so that my children's 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 children all is until Jesus comes back hopefully they will have something that they can read about what God did to one of their ancestors did in the life of one of their ancestors so they too might believe and they may join us together in um, worshiping Jesus Christ for all eternity being together without pain without suffering can I have an impact beyond this life yes it's in a memorialized type fashion create a pile of stones for yourself something that says God matters to you and matters more than anything else if he doesn't you won't do this but if he does do something that says to your future generations what God has meant to you what Jesus Christ has done for you and commit it somehow so that your story God's story in your life would not get lost. I don't know anything about my great-grandparents. Nothing. I know very little about my grandparents. And in some ways, I don't know that much about my parents either. 
And um, so what is it that you want you don't want forgotten? Write it down. Do something. Do something that marks that. Put, you can also, you know, don't ever want God forgotten. Put things up in your house that remind you of important dates, of, of favorite scriptures where you can share them with other people, your children, your grandchildren. Um, do these things, these markers, these important memorials to uh, witness of what God has done for us. And I, I just think it's really important, but we don't really talk about it that much. Um, but in the Old Testament, it's talked about a lot. We will see it more as we continue through some of these stories. We've seen it in the past where they put up these stones to mark significant events. And so where there's altars and there's stones and, and, and festivals, God says remember a lot. And so what are we doing to help future generations remember? And what are they to remember? Great thing to sort out. And um, I hope you can hang with us through all the rest of these stories as we go through the rest of the year in these stories, and we'll continue. But I'd like to pray, and I, you know, I'm going to pray that we would really remember the things that God has done for us and rediscover a level of gratitude that would want us to not forget and um, to make sure we share them. So I'll pray with me. Father in heaven, I thank you so much that, um, that you love us, that you don't just abandon us on earth to figure out life um, without a word of who you are. That you have preserved your memory of all the things we need to know in the pages of the Bible. It is a miraculous book. It shouldn't even be here. The copies we have, the, the, the accuracy from which it's been uh, protected throughout generations for thousands of years so that it is reliable historically and accurate about who you are and who we are. So, Father, I thank you that you preserved um, all this to give to us so that we might know you rightly and um, remember you rightly. And so, Father, I pray that you would give us um, call to mind events in our lives that are so significant that we would not ever want you forgotten in them and that we would pass on your memory to our future generations and um, that between now and the time that we die we would not falter our hearts would belong to you fully from now until our last breath that every breath we we have is really devoted to you as best as we can father i pray each person praying this prayer that you would take them right where they are and they would say god right where i am with all that I can, I give you my life. And whatever I'm holding back, help me to give it all up, that I might follow you with, with a reckless abandon because nobody can love me as much as you do. And I can never love you as much as you love me. But I pray, Lord, that you would increase my love and faith in you as long as I live. In Jesus' name, amen. I look forward to uh, seeing you guys live next week. And for those of you that can't, I look forward to sharing uh, his word with you again. Thank you.